Would you open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 1? And we're going to be studying this morning verses 1 through 9, but we're going to begin with an overview of the book and, um, and why these first verses are so significant in regard to uh, introducing a book like this. So couldn't be more excited. Uh, if you're visiting with us today, um, I serve on the pastoral team here, one of the pastors here, and it would be a highlight of my day if you're visiting. I'd, I'd love to meet you. Uh, love to talk with you after service if you have the time. Uh, I, after the service, I usually go back to just outside that uh, door to my right, that side of the building here. Um, and also, uh, would you be, as, you, as we're studying God's word, as, as we're uh, listening to the preaching, um, let's be alert to the Holy Spirit. Let's be alert to the Holy Spirit on how he is applying the scriptures to our hearts, how we need, how we, he's calling us to respond to the Lord about what we're learning, um, how, how he would want us to pray, um, and, and even would he want you to join with someone else to pray today. If you would, we have a prayer team that will come up during the last song, and that last song is a time for not just singing, but it's a time for praying together. So today our prayer team is, is Brad King, Anthony Brown, and Stephen Amy Avampado. So uh, as we stand for the last song, they'll be coming up right up here. Um, so don't hesitate uh, to come. During the singing is the time to come and to focus on what the Lord is putting on your heart and uh, the need you might have uh, for the Lord and his love and for your brothers and sisters to be praying with you. Okay. Well, this is the first message in our sermon series on the book of First Corinthians. We're, we're titling this, entitling this series, First Things First. And we hope it won't take you very long for you to understand why we chose that title. It's, it's really the book of First Corinthians, I think, that would really bring that title to the surface, um, particularly in regard to the gospel of God's grace being first in everything in our lives. And so I put a little note in, in the introductory section of your notes as to really we're, we're not just getting creative here about that. We're really just borrowing from the words of Scripture it's, uh, itself. And this is in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. So if you'll look at that in your notes this morning. Paul says, For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. So let's think about that idea of first, first importance, first things first. Paul is not, Paul's not mainly talking about ranking priorities. I think, I think years ago, I think that's the way I understood it. I probably taught it that way. Like Jesus first, family second, etc. I don't know if you've noticed that it, it, it doesn't mean it's one size fits all, but for a lot of people, that kind of thinking really can yield to compartmentalizing our lives um, into categories that really may act independent of each other. Um, Jesus first, family second, church, work third. I don't know where you want where you would rank those things, but. Um, have you ever noticed that there are people who would say, I believe in Christ, I attend church, I try to read my Bible occasionally, but you look at their life, and I'm not trying to be critical here, but there is really no observable fruit in their life. Their, their marriage is in disarray. I, I just wonder if it's because they have this compartmentalized and privatized view of, their, of the Christian life and what, what God does to save us, not only to unite us to himself, but to unite us to his people. And so it's just really easy then to, to just feel like I just need to try to keep those rankings, those prioritizations in order. I think what Paul is saying is way better than that. Paul is not speaking about prioritizing. Paul is talking about permeating. Of first importance would mean more of a permea permeation. Is that a word? Did I just make up a word? Thank you. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thank you. It's, 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 a, it's a gospel that's supposed to permeate our lives. 
There's a, think about the ripple effect in a, in a pool of water. The, the splash of the rock is the powerful center that sends shock waves in every direction in that body of water. It affects the whole thing. It, it doesn't just affect this one narrow space. And then maybe, maybe that space may touch another space. It is rippling out in everything. So shouldn't the gospel permeate our character, our marriages, our parenting, our relationships with other believers, how we relate to the world, how we evangelize, why we do our jobs, the whole purpose of studying and academics. And there's just so many things that would be different if the gospel was the blazing center. Wouldn't you agree? 1 Corinthians, it's going to help us increasingly be gospel-centered in our doctrine, but also promote gospel-centeredness in our culture as a church family. If you are visiting today, I'm, I think that's great that you're here. And whether or not God would, would want you to be united to this particular church family, I hope this will serve your soul as you look for a gospel-centered church family to belong to. And we'd love to help you. If, if, if it's not us, we'd love to try to help you find where that place is. And as a bonus, we are going to learn from the scriptures why Sovereign Grace Family of Churches holds to what we call the seven shared values of Sovereign Grace Churches. They're not seven shared preferences. They're seven shared biblical values. And you know what? Most of them are taught in 1 Corinthians including gospel-centered preaching and practice, reformed doctrine of salvation, continuationist pneumatology, complementarian in the roles of men and women in the home and in the church, elder-led and governed churches, and our value of partnering, partnering with other churches for ministry and mission and church planting. And we believe you will see why gospel centrality and these values should not just promote a, a doctrinal connectedness that we have to each other, but it actually should promote virtues that, that, are, that are visible and a blessing to the church and, and virtues like humility, joy. What good is sound doctrine if we're arrogant? What good is sound doctrine if we are just embittered toward other people, almost like... There's talk about, I don't know, here goes another old illustration that 75% of you probably won't get. There used to be a comedian named W.C. Fields. Have you ever heard of W.C. Fields? Anybody? Thank you. Two people in the room have heard of W.C. Fields. W.C. Fields used to be this guy that kind of people just bothered him, especially kids. And he, he talked like this. And he would look at kids and he would say, get out of here, kid, you bother me. Oh, I gotta, I gotta rise there, Brandon. Um, oh man! Now, sound doctrine, gospel centrality, is actually a, a, a fertile soil for the for the virtues of humility and joy and gratitude. Haven't you found gratitude to be one of the most attractive things about a human being? Encouragement, generosity, servant-heartedness, and godliness. So 1 Corinthians is going to teach us about how the gospel informs and empowers us to glorify God in every situation and in every relationship we have. So as such, our main point this morning is this, and it's in your notes. When we make the gospel of grace of first importance, it transforms not only how we see ourselves, but also how we see and relate to others in the body of Christ and beyond. So I want to pray there, but I'm going to wait to read the text until after the background. Because I, as a method of my madness, you might be going, okay, this is weird. Now, I think as you hear the background and the, how the church was planted and what was going on in the city of Corinth and how that was affecting the church, I think when we read the text it's going to grip you. And I hope it'll grip us together in a way that we would say, oh God, let us be more like this. Heavenly Father, we come before you as we study your word in this new series, Lord. And 
God, we don't want to just study this book academically. We know you've given it to us to pastor us. We know you've given this book to us to transform us, encourage us, convict us of sin. There will be plenty of times that we'll be convicted of sin, but it's by a loving Father who is transforming us and equipping us to shine a brighter and brighter light in a darkening world. So God, please, use this book to bring your name glory, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, to give us greater unity than we've ever known before in the gospel, and to mobilize our mission in reaching Midland and the nations for Christ. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. A little background. I'm not going to read Acts 18. I put that in your notes because I'm going to ask you to read it. Would you do a little homework? Take, take a peek at Acts 18, verses 1 through 17, because that's the planting of the church at Corinth. And I think it's important. I'm gonna, we're going to do a little bit of a flyover of some of the, the details about that. But would you read that on your own? So Corinth is a city in Greece. It's a port city, booming economy. They love their sports. They had what was called the Isthmian Games. And that was for Greek citizens, and they held those games in the years where there weren't Olympics. Uh, they were athletic and musical competitions in a festival environment, and it was mainly in honor of the sea god Poseidon. They loved chariot races. So I think for us, think NASCAR. I, I, they, they just, I mean, you know, people who love NASCAR love NASCAR. And these people were that way about chariot racing. So I want you to be thinking about it. Musical, festival, athletics, um, chariot races. So I want you to think Super Bowl, Mardi Gras, the Daytona 500, and a Taylor Swift concert all happening at the same time. And this was happening on a regular basis. It was built under the protection of what was called the Acre Corinth. It's just mo I, I, Google that <laughs> if you want. Text me, I'll send you how to spell that. I, I, I spelled it wrong three times before I got it right. Um, it was this monolithic rock surrounding the city with these large mountain peaks. It made it a hugely fortified city and gave that feeling that no one can defeat us. It had unlimited supplies of water. There was a unique limestone that was just right there, and it promoted a prolific building industry. The economy was strong. It was also a city that prided itself on its open-mindedness and commitment to sexual liberty and freedom. That was a commitment. As such, it specialized in immorality, pornography, prostitution, adultery, and the molestation of children. On the top peak of the acronym was the Temple of Aphrodite. You might have heard that back in your school days and looking at Greek culture. And uh, this, She was known as the goddess of love and pleasure, and people would flock there for what was essentially the worship of sex. That's what was really happening in a carnal sense. Here was the lie. It was believing that if you surrendered your body to Aphrodite with one of the temple prostitutes, you would be blessed with peace, freedom, and beauty. Isn't it interesting the arguments we come up with just so that we can engage our lusts? And you didn't have to go up to the temple necessarily. At night, 1,000 temple prostitutes descended into the town to offer more opportunities to seek satisfaction through false worship. Thus, sexual temptation was always looking... So imagine living in Corinth. Wasn't, gi wasn't that gigantic? It wasn't like New York City or anything like that. Wasn't that, you know, that kind of size? Imagine living in Corinth. You couldn't go anywhere without seeing the Temple of Aphrodite. I want you to think about our culture. In some ways, I think it's like we're carrying the Temple of Aphrodite around on our telephones, right? So there was this, this looming sense of darkness and temptation and this, this almost like the, the song of these sirens 
calling you away from faithfulness in marriage and waiting until you're married in order to enjoy God's plan for sex and all of these things. It was just, it was always, we were always living in the shadow of Aphrodite. But it wasn't just that. They came down into the town. So sexual temptation wasn't just looking down on you from the city. It could literally come knocking at your door at night, just like it does too often in so many poor people's homes when, the, when that blue glow of their, inner, their computer screen and the, their gazed look in their eyes. Let's please know, pornography was a huge issue for me when I was, when, when I was a preteen and teenager. And, it, and the lies of it, the grip of it, sexual liberty and activity were so prevalent and common. The phrase to Corinthianize was a nickname for sexual activity. And did you know what they called Christians who did not participate and proclaimed God's plan for sex and marriage and gender? They, I'm sorry, I didn't read that right. The Christians were proclaiming God's plan for sex, marriage, and gender. They were proclaiming, you know what they called them? Haters of mankind. Boy, it seems like they're not too different from what people call us. Their idolatry, their politics, their academics, their worship of athletics, entertainment, lust, it just groomed them. And I use that word intentionally. That can be, used to be not a, it was an amoral word, a moral word, but now it's just that, that word grooming is, is pretty distasteful in regard to how people do that with children. But it groomed them into a greater and greater focus on self-satisfaction. Do you realize that's what our culture tries to It's grooming us to think that self-satisfaction is it. That's the meaning of life. That was happening then. It was... It was they were grooming them into greater focus on self-satisfaction and the need for ongoing experiences of happiness and sensory things. And that led into the church. Have you ever been to a church that it wasn't a good service unless you, unless you were, were, felt something again and again? Oh, there wasn't a healing miracle. There wasn't this. There wasn't that. Praise God. We believe in healing miracles. But we and God, and you know what? God wants to give us experiences of his love. But it's in, the, it's in the context of him being the blazing center. He is our desire, not the experience. And God loves to again give the experience of his love to us. I think in so many ways, you know, I'll be honest with you, I think in so many ways churches are grooming its, its attenders to, to just, it's almost like, okay, we're not going to go to the pimp we're not going to go to the drug dealer for our high. We're going to go to, our, go to the church for our high. And there was never any gospel salvation message. There was never any transformation. There was never any prizing of godliness. I felt like I was just reading things out of our newspaper when I was studying over these last few weeks. Paul comes into Corinth as a tent maker a leather worker, because he didn't want to look to anyone else to provide for his needs. He didn't want anyone to say, he's, he only does this for the money. He's a false prophet. He only wants, he wants to use you, not to serve you. So he was, he was, he just went in. I'm going to, I'm going to work for my living and preach the gospel along the way. He met Priscilla and Aquila there, and they labored together for the gospel, and then beyond that. And as the gospel gained traction, the Jews threatened and reviled and ultimately attacked Paul. Paul had been beaten so much before coming to Corinth, he became fearful. And, 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 and was, here's a, here was the temptation. He, the fear began to cause him to be tempted to no longer teach the gospel. Have you been, have you been fearful? To share the gospel with someone else. You know what? If I gave an altar call for that, a bunch of us would have to answer, wouldn't we? I'm not going to give an altar call for that. But do we do anything about it? I am constantly more fearful to share the gospel than I actually share it. So what needs to change? 
doesn't something need to change? Wouldn't God help me in making that change? Well, God helped Paul. He gave him a vision. And he said in that vision, don't be afraid. Don't be silent. Keep on speaking. What a great simple message, isn't it? So Paul stayed there a year and a half, and the church was established. The, this, this is a culture that valued wisdom and philosophy almost to the point of worship. Think of an environment of a Harvard or Yale with no regard to one true God. You know, we, we talk about how those, so many of those Ivy League schools were, were started as Christian schools and seminaries. And, and now the liberalization of everything, now they're just, they're, they're really now anti-God in so many ways. There's Corinth. There's a high regard for rhetoric and ability to speak intellectually and charismatically. So the cult of personality and academics and politics and pagan religion were a major thing. They were self-sufficient. They didn't need anyone else, they thought. They had all the resources. They had money. They had educational opportunities. They had industry. They had entertainment. They had athletics, all in the context of a mountain fortress. And they were self-promoting. Proud and arrogant, they would have loved social media. They would have been experts at taking selfies that tried to show everyone you're living the good life. In fact, did you know that your best life now was already being written in Corinth so many years ago? Anthony Thistleton says this about the city of Corinth. The culture of Corinth, and certainly of its aspiring climbers, was one of self-promotion. He then quotes another uh, pastor scholar named Ben Witherington, who says, In Paul's time, many in Corinth were already suffering from self-made person escapes humble origin syndrome. And isn't it, I mean, don't you sometimes feel like somehow if I'm going to make any difference in the world, I've got to be great. Rather than, no, I need to be dependent on the one who is great. So that gave challenges to the church. Paul, after he had left, he learned that the church was having major problems. And so he writes 1 Corinthians to try to address those problems. And I just gave the smattering of what we're going to be studying over these next months in regard to some of the problems. 1 Corinthians 1 through 4, there were divisions in the church. As the leadership team of the Corinth church grew, so grew people who ide idealized and idolized leaders according to personality and their preferences. It would, they, they didn't view leaders through gospel centrality. They didn't view leaders through character. They didn't view leaders through the calling of God. And so they said things like, we are of Paul, we are of Apollos, we're of Cephas, we're even of Jesus, but not in the way that we would want to be. I want you to think of Democrat and Republican, and not merely the wars that Democrats and Republicans have with each other. Have you noticed more and more and more they can't get along within their own parties? So I want you thinking about that invading the church. That was what was happening in regard to the sense of venom and and vitriol, and I can't think of another V word. I don't even know how I came out with those two words. But, but can you imagine going into a church and, and, and nobody really smiled because you were of Cephas and you were of Apollos and, and there was this, just this personality cult going on. I think we need to be careful of that in this United States. We are, in, we are inundated with personality cults in this country. Guys, we can't let that come and be a part of what, what it means to be a body of believers. And you know what? I, and it was, it was as the church was growing and their leadership base was growing that their immaturity in this area led to those kind of divisions. You know, the Lord, we've told you in the past, the, the Lord has blessed us with seven guys who have asked to be evaluated for a pastoral call in their life. So if you're visiting with us, look how little our church is. We shake our head constantly. Lord, wow, help us, help us care for these men well. And can you imagine if all of those men were called to be elders, our eldership would triple? Triple? So we're three now. In a couple of years, we could be nine if all those guys are called to eldership. 
You know what I think? I think we need to be careful as God grows the base of leadership. That you're not looking at leadership through your preferences and through personality-centered criteria. Amen? They, they had a growing disrespect for Paul. They dared him to prove his apostleship. There were lawsuits between Christians. And it wasn't just the, 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 the uh, technicality, the litigiousness of it all. It was revenge and profit-minded in the church. 1 Corinthians 5 through, a seven, 5 through 7, they, there was immorality tolerated in the church. Well, of course, the world, the, the world of Corinth is pressing in on the church, trying to conform it to itself. There was constant temptation to call something normal because it was common. Have you, have you just noticed more and more things that, that, that even unbelieving society in the United States years ago would have called sinful or wrong the more, it can be, the more it can be understood as common. And this is common. Homosexuality is common. And now they're pushing for, for sex between adults and kids, that that could be love. And you're hearing it more and more. It, the more something, it, listen, precious, precious brothers and sisters, we cannot let our ethics be determined by what's common. We have to let our ethics be determined by what's normal. You know what's normal? This book tells us what's normal. But see, what the the world is doing is saying, if it's common, it's normal. That's not true. So this immorality was being tolerated increasingly in the church, and it affected views on singleness. Man, I pray for our singles, our precious singles. It affected views on singleness and on marriage and divorce and why people were getting divorced. And oh my goodness, verses eight, uh, chapters eight through ten, it was on personal rights and liberties. How do you handle the huge feast that took place in honor of um, Aphrodite or Poseidon or any of the other false gods eating meat that was sacrificed to those false false uh, gods? How do we enjoy God's good gifts and enjoy our freedom in Christ? yet also being very willing for the love of others to limit our liberties. We're going to learn about that in the book. And you know what? Here's what's so cool. When God calls us to limit our liberties, we're so free in Christ, we don't lose any freedom to limit our liberty. Christianity is a whole different ballgame, isn't it? So there was the misuse of communion and spiritual gifts from chapters 11 through 14. They gathered for self-satisfaction and self-promotion. Well, what do you think is going to happen with things like communion and spiritual gifts? They didn't gather with a passion for edification. Drunkenness in the fellowship meal and the abuse of communion wine, uh, the idolized abuse of speaking gifts, speaking in tongues and other gifts of speech, and so apparently from what some of the scholars say, you, you, this was like, this was something akin to walking into a, a, an environment where everyone is speaking and nobody's listening. Everyone's speaking, no one's understanding anything. There's no edification, but there's a lot of self-promotion. <laughs> One person pictured it this way. Imagine Parliament. Did you, have you guys ever listened to it, like a Parliament thing on C-SPAN or whatever and you know, and those guys are always, I wish I could do a British accent. You know, I, I, you know, just, and you, you ever kind of go, how do they get anything done? Because it's just all this stuff. And this one guy said, imagine them drunk. <laughs> and they're coming together, and this was happening in the church. Oh, my goodness. Well, 15 and 16, chapters 15 and 16, there's bad doctrine going around, and And it's about the resurrection. It doesn't matter what you do with your body because just eat, drink, and marry because then you die. David Garland said this. I think this is really a keeper. The problem was not that the church was in Corinth, but that too much of Corinth was in the church. Don't we have that same temptation today? Can I ask you, if you were to put yourself under that lens, how much of the world is in us, in our church fellowship? 
the, our values, our desires, our hope in the future? It's a good question to ask. So they're a divided church, a proud church, an ungrateful church, an immoral church, an irreverent church, a selfish and self-indulgent church, a doctrinally confused church. Okay, so now you're Paul. How do you talk to these folks? How, do you, how would you go about talking to this group of people? All correction all the time? That's what our culture is saying. Tell it like it is, brother. Re, re, repent on repeat? Is that what we do? There needs to be correction. Don't get me wrong. I want you to think of how Paul would be tempted to do this poorly. How do you, let me ask you, parents, how do you go about correcting your kids when they're acting out in public? Are you, are you correcting them? I'll, put, I'll just put it to me. When I was raising our, our sons, when Jen and I were raising our sons, and they were acting out in public, can you admit, and they, were, they were the pastor's kids. So there was even more of this temptation in me that, wait a minute, I've got to have my house in order, and you're watching whether I do. And so many times I didn't correct them for their good. I corrected them to salvage my reputation with you. Can I thank you for not looking at Alan's kids, Alan and Danette's kids, Eric and Aaron's kids, any of our leaders, as though somehow a pastor's kid comes out of the womb holy. Thank you for remembering our kids are sinners too, and the parents that are raising them are sinners too. And we need help, and we need grace, and we need patience, just like you do. I'm so thankful that you're a church like that. So, but, but think about how Paul, this is a church he planted, and they're acting like this? Does he go about salvaging his reputation, or what do I say that will be for their good? How about this one? After all the sacrifices I made for you, working my hands to the bone as a tent maker so that I wouldn't be a burden on the church and to help others grow and to know I'm not doing this for the money, do you even have a clue? <laughs> this sounds so much like what parents can do with kids. Do you even have a clue of all the nights I stayed up late and all the mornings I woke up early just to feed your belly? Don't you think Paul was tempted by that? Aren't you tempted by that? That it's not about the godly good of the people we're relating to. Paul, isn't this a church you planted? Have you ever thought of another career choice? <laughs> I mean, there's so many crazy things. And Paul already struggled with fear in ministering to that church when it was first planted. What do you think those fears might raise themselves up again? You bet they would. So now, let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 through 9, okay? Because this is what he said. Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, Call to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I, <laughs> I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus that in every way you were enriched in him, in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Uh, don't you want a friend like that? 
Don't you want pastors like that? Don't you want small group leaders like that? Wives, don't you want a husband like that? Husbands, don't you want a wife like that? Kids, don't you want parents like that? I think we all could say, oh, Lord, help us. Help us be more like this. Well, let's see how Paul came to be more like this. So let's remember the main point again. When we make the gospel of grace of first importance, it transforms not only how we see ourselves, but also how we see and relate to others in the body of Christ and beyond. So the first thing, so I'm using the first things first moniker. So point one, first things first, and these are short points, so if, you, if you, your stomach's already growling, <laughs> don't worry. Um, remember God's grace in the past. Remember God's grace in the past. Did you notice Paul saturated them with the centrality of Christ and his gospel? Nine times in nine verses, he names Christ. <laughs> That's the, that was awesome. I love that. And his, and his finished work, Christ's finished work, and his faithfulness to the end. Paul almost always begins by telling his reader who he is in relationship to God's grace, who we are in relationship to God's grace, and what our relationships with each other should be like in relationship to God's grace. Notice as you're reading Paul's epistles, he does that again and again and again. He doesn't want you to identify yourself according to, I don't know why you'd want to watch the Cowboys today. They're going to play the commanders. It may as well be a bye, right? But, but let's say you're watching the Cowboys today. Every, yeah, maybe too big a word. A lot of the commercials you're going to see are trying to get you to identify your life according to the car you drive, according to how ripped you are, according to how good that steak would taste, or what about a beer? I mean, it's, it's just constantly, or you don't have enough life insurance. What a horrible father you are. And I mean, there's, there's so many things that are out there trying to say, you are, you, you, your identity, you are defined by, by the, what you what you re revolve your life around. And Paul says, no, you're defined by who you are in Christ. That's who you're defined by. Well, when did all of this begin happening? Did it just happen upon your choice of Jesus? Well, let's dig in. Let's find out more about this. Notice how often in these first few verses, Paul used the word called. So if, you're, if you don't mind writing on your Bibles, I would go back. First, I'd circle every time he's using Jesus, nine times in nine verses. Then I'd go back and I'd circle how many times he uses the word called. Sinclair Ferguson, just a pastor, scholar that I just love, he said, one of the most frequent one-word definitions of a Christian in the New Testament is called. Called. So let's talk about that. Verse 1, you see it. Paul called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. That's important because they were diminishing his role in their lives. And he was, he was telling them that, that, that God, by his wisdom and grace, had given them this calling to be an apostle. But when he's speaking of calling, he's not just talking about his role in the church. He's describing the outworking of God's grace in the past. Let's, let's dig deeper. God's divine decisions precede and enable human decisions. Paul wasn't seeking God. You remember his story as Saul. He was seeking to destroy the church, not attend it. That was, that was Saul. He was seeking to destroy the church, not attend it, until he heard God call him by name. And it wasn't just a call, like, moms, how many times do you make a dinner, and you call the family to dinner, and your call doesn't seem to carry a lot of weight? Poor Jan. When the boys were growing up, you know, she, she would call, say, hey, uh, dinner's about five minutes, ten minutes, you know, enough time when I would, uh, you know, when I would get home. And, uh, you know, so in my head, I have this weird warped idea of time. So I'm thinking, okay, the, there's been a call, but it's my discretion as to how I interpret the call. 
and how I respond to the call. The boys, they're playing with G.I. Joes or outside throwing the baseball or all these kind of things. It's amazing how a call just from a human being doesn't necessarily carry a lot of weight, but it does with God. When God calls us, it's a summons. It's a summons. And didn't you see that in Paul's life? Go back. You know, we essentially gave you an overview of Genesis. And I just tried to let the text speak for itself. But was it Adam that first chose God? Or was it God that first chose Adam and sought Adam? Was it Noah that first chose God? Was it Moses that first chose God? Was it Abraham that first chose God? Again and again and again, you find this intervening grace and summons of God that is preceding our calling back to God ourselves. You're going to see that here in the text. So he's, he's describing the outworking of God's grace in the past. So that's what's happening here. Called an apostle, he's reminding them, God has called me to the church. We'll get more into that as the book unfolds. Then he calls to the church. So listen, don't get, just, let's don't get, listen, there's some things that it's helpful to not, to go beyond the English in. What does the church mean? Literally, the called out ones. So he uses call just even in naming the church. He says they're sanctified. Now, this is interesting because what we typically talk about in our church of sanctification is you've come to know Jesus Christ, and now there is this progressive work of God by his grace to make us more and more like Jesus, right? So there was a progressive. This is not progressive. The verb tense is, is past tense with present action. So, so Paul is saying, you were sanctified before the foundations of the world. How? Well, because Ephesians teaches us, because you were called, you were chosen by God to be saved before the foundations of the world. Now, that was all in relationship to the blood Jesus shed for us, etc. And then he goes further and he says, so you are called to be saints together in Christ Jesus because God, in his, in his mercy and unexplainable grace, set his saving love upon us sinners in ways that we can't even understand. So being called is the outworking of being chosen by God to be saved before the foundations of the world. If you want to just see it in two sentences, Romans 8, 29, and 30 are great helps. For those whom he foreknew, and so this isn't just God knew information in advance. The, the, well, and God does know information in advance. Of course he does. He's God. He's ever-present in all generations. He, that's, he's amazing. You can't even begin to <laughs> mind the depths of all that. It's not saying that he just knew what we would decide, or he just knew that I would decide to follow him. And so since God saw I would choose to follow him, God chose me. No, Romans 3 tells you what God knew in advance, that there are none good. There are none who seek after God. All have been corrupted. All are dead in sin and transgression. So the word foreknew here is almost like in, the, in Genesis talking about Adam and Eve. He knew her. There was this sense of intimacy. There was this sense of loving in advance. I set my love upon you in advance. Let's, keep, let, let's let the verse keep speaking for itself. He also predestined to do what? Well, predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And now we'll keep going. And those whom he predestined, he also, would you say it with me? He called. He called. And those whom he called, he justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. So what happens to the called when they hear him call is they call upon the name of the Lord. 
God, God's call upon our lives gives us grace to respond to him with calling out to him for our salvation. And he is our savior. So that, so this is, so now where's, where, why is all this important in regard to having encouragement for our own souls and how we view other people? Listen, remembering that because God initiated my salvation when he knew the worst about me, yet he loved me and had his son die for me, nonetheless reminds me that I am his treasure. I wonder if I looked you in the eye today and we had a stare down like see who blinks first contest. If I said, do you, do you believe that God treasures you? I guess a lot of it would be determined on what you've been taught in the past. There's every reason to believe he wouldn't. But by grace, he does. By the finished work of Christ, he does. He treasures you. I have to gulp when I, when I hear that. Because I just think of all the reasons why he shouldn't because of my choices. You know what anchors me? Not my choices. His choice of me. That anchors me. That, that pulls me back in. When I am so depressed and discouraged about my many choices to sin, my laziness, my apathy, and my fear, and my worry, and my doubt, so many me-centered things, so many choices I'm making, if my choice is the ultimate issue of my life, I'm doomed. I'm doomed, you guys. I am not going to stay a Christian. I'm going to be given over to depression. I'm going to be given over to all these things because my choice is the ultimate thing. It's not the ultimate thing. His choice is the ultimate thing. His choice of grace is the ultimate thing. And it keeps me secure. It gives me assurance that if he loved me in, by grace in the past, don't I know he's going to stay with me right now? Regardless of what happens, regardless of what happens in our nation this year, regardless of what happens in our families and with our children, our choices are not ultimate and determinative. His are, and his are gracious choices. Now, how does that affect with each other? I think, it, I think the same thing happens here. Are you more aware of God's grace and loving choice of you from eternity past then you are more, first back to you, more than you are aware of your sins and deficiencies. Now, how about this? How does God's grace in the past affect how you see, feel, and relate to others in regard to their sinful choices, their mistakes, their offenses and, uh, and deficiencies, especially when it's against you? Do you hold them as though your choice against me is determinative. Or if they're a confessing brother or sister in the Lord, do you go back and go, isn't it great that yes, our choices have consequences. Yes, there needs to be repentance and forgiveness and patience and long suffering. But isn't it great that God's not basing my salvation and my sanctification ultimately on my choice of him, but his choice of me. And isn't it great that my relationship with you, I know it's the same for you. That, that's not going to be your choices even against me that are determinative. It's God's choice of you and his choice of me that will help us walk this out and learn how to fellowship together and not give up on each other. So that's the, there's the first point. God's grace in the present. Paul gives thanks to God for them and for the gifts of the Spirit that God had given them, even though they were misusing and abusing and hurting each other with them, let alone causing the watching world around them to think they were crazy. You'll see that in verse 14, chapter 14. So where's the correction, Paul? Paul's saying, I'm going to get to correction. Why do you so want to jump to correction? Because God doesn't do that with you. It, the correction is coming, but Paul first stops to point out evidences of God's grace at work. 
not to first point out what's sinful and broken. He thanks God they were enriched in all speech and all knowledge, and that they were not lacking any gift as they wait for the coming of Christ. Gordon Fee, look at this. This is hilarious. This is so well said. He said, what is remarkable here is the apostles' ability to thank God for the very things in this church that because of the abuses are also causing him grief. That sounds very day-to-day life, doesn't it? (laughs) Husbands and wives, are you regularly thanking God regardless of your spouse's weaknesses and deficiencies and brokenness and offenses? Are you regularly thanking God? If they're a professing Christian, are you regularly thanking God that I'm not going to limit my spouse to their deficiency? I'm not going to make the main issue that the thing that holds us, the thing that we have in common is your sin. Too many marriages do that. Too many churches do that. That, that. That the intermediary that holds us together is our sin. That doesn't, that's not the way God does it? Paul is first looking to where God's at work in the church, not where they're falling short. God points out how he's working in my life and your life, not to ignore my sins and deficiencies. You know why he does it? He does it to build my faith so that I can address my sins and deficiencies in the context of being loved, in the context of having his strength and his commitment to me. Have you ever thought that the ultimate goal of correction is actually to build the faith of the person you're talking to? I had this picture this morning of, have you ever gone to pet a dog? And you just, just were just, this is the cutest dog, and you went to pet it, and that dog freaked out. Because it's been abused. And so now it's interpreting life in accordance with just always being corrected and corrected and corrected without any grace, without any pointing out where God's at work in in the fruit of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. It's just all correction all the time. And hasn't sometimes your soul or spirit felt like that puppy? It's like a person may not even be saying anything, but it has to, it's something you can tell. You feel a correction's coming on. <laughs> and it's just like, oh, oh, God, make us a church that as we, as we seek to identify grace before the sins, that, that we would, that there'd be a, a safety here to deal with sin, not to ignore it, but it'd be a place where you didn't think that correction was just to serve the other person so you'd quit bugging them. I think so much of correction is not even for the good of the person we're correcting. It's so you'll quit bugging me, or you'll feel bad enough for what you did to me. I've told you this, this illustration before, but just if we didn't, if, you know, guess who lives like that? Cor- Corinth. The world lives like that. The most natural thing in our lives is to be critical. It it doesn't take any effort, does it? Lucy and Linus, (laughs) Lucy's looking at Linus, and she shakes her head, and she says, it happens every time I look at you. And Linus says, what? She says, I feel a criticism coming on. (laughs) It's almost so sad. Can I say something kind of? I don't mean this to sound harsh. If we're more given to correction and adjustment than we are to pointing out how God's grace is at work, we're lazy Christians. And if you can't identify grace in your spouse or in your kids or in your small group or in your church, can I say something else? That's saying as much about your heart as it is their deficiency. David Pryor, this is in your notes, it says this, the one fact that most people have at their fingertips concerning the Corinthian church is that it was a mess. (laughs) Full of problems, sins, division, and heresy. It was in this sense no different than any modern church. 
The church is a fellowship of sinners before it's a fellowship of saints. We need to register this primary truth. Paul looks at the Corinthian church as it is in Christ before he looks at anything else that is true of the church. This is interesting language. That disciplined statement of faith. It's a statement of faith when I tell you about the fruit of the Spirit I see at work in your life. About the gifts of the Spirit I see in your life. That disciplined statement of faith is rarely made in local churches. The warts are examined and lamented. But often there's no vision of what God has already done in Christ. His confidence, Paul's confidence, in the church at Corinth is based on God's generosity and God's faithfulness. And then there's the future grace. Eric, you want to go ahead and come on up? God's grace in the future, and you see that in verses 8 and 9. Whenever you feel like you're not going to make it, you read verses 8 and 9. God says his grace will sustain us to the end. And not only sustain us, it'll sustain us guiltless to the end. You want to know what your future looks like? Standing guilt-free in front of the Savior who bled and died to buy that guilt-free life for you through the shedding of his blood. Verse 9 says, God will be faithful Because it was by him that I was called into fellowship with his son, Jesus. For his own glory, he will never give up. And he will finish what he started. And when did he start it? See, there's where a lot of people say, he'll finish the good work he started in you. And I used to think that that meant when I prayed the prayer. When my decision was determinative. Oh, wait. (laughs) God will finish the good work he started in eternity past. When amazingly, he set his saving love upon me before the foundations of the world. So that's why he's never going to give up on us. And that's why we should never give up on each other. Amen? Would you please stand? Steve and Amy, would you guys come and be available here? Listen, there's a lot of ways you could pray today. Some of it might be prayers of, of repentance. Some of it might be prayers that, that maybe you, you've been the one that has just, all you've really known is correction as rejection. You haven't been around a people that first, let's, let's first tell you about where God is working in your life, to build faith in the work of God in your life, and then together let's deal with the deficiencies. Husbands and wives might want to come and, and pray together about maybe the way you've been treating each other, and the, the, the lack of contentment you've had in Christ. You've been trying to find it in your spouse, and they can't even live up to that. And then no wonder they're, they're deficient because you're setting a bar that even God doesn't set for them. And there's just so many ways to pray this morning. God bless you.